So welcome everybody. I'm very happy to see a good contingent of uh, our students here because we're really happy to have Rebecca Mendez here today with us and absolutely delighted that she applied for a position that we have in design. Um, so you may also be aware that Rebecca's posters of architectures, events, and shows that she did all of the, those designs that over the years, right? So you actually have been coming to mm -hmm. UCLA for quite a bit. Um, born in Mexico City and uh, graduated from Art Center, where <laughs> she ended up um, actually being the creative director of the design there. Her list of achievements is actually pretty spectacular, and it um, it covers video and um, film and many different areas, and she's actually done a little piece in some movies to some screenwriting, which is very impressive to me. So I was talking to Christian earlier about it and um, going back and forth between corporate and educational spaces is a kind of a natural mm -hmm. transition. So Rebecca right now is um, a creative director, actually a senior partner at Ogilvy Mather brand. And are you going to talk about all these different things you're doing instead of me rattling off and taking up all of your time? Yes, yeah, sure, of course. Okay, so yeah. please give a warm welcome to Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you for, um, for what I understand you all are kind of skipping class to be here, so I appreciate that. Um, skipping lunch. Yeah, that matters, but you've been fed, and very nicely. Um, one of the things I think that it's, it's important, and, and uh, in, in having been born in Mexico City and then coming here at 17, is that it really has been an interesting thing to be in that cusp of having to, to migrate into another culture. Um, one of those things, what it does is that it has opened a lot of the senses for me because in many ways when you move into a place where you don't understand culture, language, it really leaves you to have to read beyond what people are exposing to you. So in, in our field of communication that has been incredibly uh, uh, like an asset for me, of course in many ways I hated having to be here in a culture that I didn't understand anything and it was really shocking. But uh, when I learned, and I think to a lot of you that come from other countries, you will find your term with your origin or where your essence in a sense. But when I kind of liberated myself from identity and realized that, at least for myself and through study, because most of my master's work was in trying to understand identity. And um, through reading Trinti Minham, some of you might know of her, but she, is, she has a lot of films and, and books about identity. There was something interesting about that I'm in communication, creating identities that are very much a construct completely from beginning to end and that you choose how to mold them and where to take them. That why in the world my identity was fixed then? Why would I have to be then fixed in a certain Mexicanity that people were looking for in me? So liberating myself and my identity and, cre and really thinking about it in terms of malleable uh, uh, acquisitions that I choose to kind of align myself with today, but then maybe not tomorrow. That in itself, of course, the identity of change is one identity. But somehow it just you know, made me feel that, forget that, I'm a hybrid, I'm whatever it's becoming. And in many ways, the way that I deal with design, the way that I deal with film, the way that I deal with fine art, it is these beautiful cross-pollinations where I really believe where the most unusual ways of thinking emerge. So you will find that a lot of my work happens there. The fact that I'm right now in Ogilvy and Mather, advertising agency, monolithic you know, a machine that has agencies plastered throughout the globe, um, it's interesting because I am running within that agency a group called Brand Integration Group, which means I'm bringing all the different disciplines that I have learned. I'm bringing in from a, an umbrella or a foundation, but really it's almost like the surrounding um, membranes of the thinking, the beginning strategies of how do you want to uh, uh, 
uh, position something? How do you want to, because it affects business strongly. So the positioning of your brand and of course the decisions that you make on how to ma make that brand manifest lay a lot in between the advertising code that Ogilvy and Mather has. So what my group comes and brings, it brings how does a brand migrate to architecture? How does a brand migrate to film? How does it migra a brand mig mi migrate to product, to print media, to other alternative ways of even advertising that are just maybe not so common? Um, so you'll see, what you'll see with my work is that I, will, I have three, three kinds of me, if I would say. One of them does a lot of uh, uh, research and more free work through recent sense. And I named my company Recent Sense mainly because I wanted, I like the feel of the word itself in terms of rhythm, but it also brings reason and the senses into equal terms, both an equal intelligence, not one greater than the other. We have really devoid uh, uh, in this culture the body from that intelligence, and I'm just definitely willing to convey anything to you at the same level right here and right here. So there's like, and a lot of people are very good at bringing it here and then they're like uh, you know taking it down here it's like he doesn't want to like teflon right there <laughs> and then other people they're like right here so comfy that <laughs> just nothing ever comes to the reason and gets critic you know enters a critical um, uh, uh, way so what's important is to in a way and that's something that maybe through tai chi or through acupuncture or something is like let's have that flow very active and very mobile um, so that, uh, in my work, then again, it's like free art and then the, the, the research. Then there is Rebecca Mendes Communication Design that I do commercial works, for example, UCLA School of Architecture, all of their communications for the last six, seven years. Um, I do uh, a restaurant with Tom Main called Tsunami that it's uh, archigraphic murals. I do another restaurant in Pasadena, Sol y Azul, so I'm actually designing the architecture, designing the furniture. So there's something interesting like that, or even collaborating with Mike Figgis with this film of Time Code. Um, so that falls in that area. And then Ogilvy & Mather, Brand Integration Group. Heavy executive advertising, you know, you have to like, you know, come in in a room and it's mainly men, you know, there. And so for all women, you know, you have to understand that that's uh, obviously a, a challenge, an interesting one, which I'm very, very excited about. And, um, but mainly it deals a lot about it is strategy of business, primarily, and then your outcome. Of course it matters how it's represented, but it really is, you know, if you see the, the kind of discussions and all the practices that we have, it's like really the, the, the manifestation, the physical manifestation has to go through, you know, everybody's stamp and signature and well, I approve, I don't approve. I mean, it's just pretty, an incredible world in that sense. So I think that what I'll do is that I will start showing work, because I think that you guys are here for that too. I will show work in those um, areas. I think that, oh, I'll just put this title screen because you need to know, you know, recent sense is a funny one to kind of, oh, I did not even launch that one, but. I use PowerPoint. So those are the kind of works. Greg Lynn, I've collaborated with Greg Lynn in some very interesting projects, um, a couple, Guggenheim Museum. Um, let's see. So that's a little bit, that's pretty much how I consider my world. That's, a, that's where I live in those spaces. And what's that? What's before? Okay. I think I'll start with the mural of a tsunami. What's interesting about tsunami is that it really was an opportunity to be able to bring together all of the different areas of interest I have. It was very simple, just developing logotype, developing um, uh, uh, very, uh, let me just get this, I can't speak and touch this at the same time. Okay, so we basically have a logo mark, 20,000 square foot mural, um, interior signage with dig digital video screens, exterior signage, um, 
Oh, the content, yeah, outdoor signage, collateral, menu, mattress, stationary, interior design. So it's, 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 it's everything all encompassing. And for that, what I did is that to be able to create a myth, I mean, we are pretty much storytellers and myth makers. So for me to be able to create a myth around a Pan-Asian restaurant, I just thought, you know, Pan-Asian is very much surrounded by water, is all about this idea of the sensual aspect or the sensual quality of eating. You eat your food, it dissolves within you, it incorporates, becomes you. So there was something about all of these ways in which then the body and then the myth of of Asia can then blend into um, a set of images or a group of images. So I'm a diver, I went underwater, I was able to, for me it was important to get this sense of you know, uh, lack of gravity, to be able to feel that it really is emanating and it's uh, moving throughout in that sensual space. So these were stills from that shoot. And this is a little bit of composition of a few things. You have the logotype that has a gesture of the um, uh, Asian calligraphy throughout, because it really was Korean, Chinese, um, uh, Japanese cuisine all blending together, some dishes from uh, Thailand. This is from the animation that was in the, in the, to be in the signage, the interior signage, in which you would have messages changing. For example, haiku in Japanese, or you know, some other beautiful things, welcome in other languages. And then you know, those up there, too, were from that. That's the logotype. This Asian grill could position itself throughout, according to need, and the letters could be vertical or horizontal. This was a way that I began to just animate the idea of the water. And this is, you know, again, it's like a lot of this is very simple. Uh, high production sometimes really castrate uh, creativity. So basically, I took a bucket, I put a printout, I kicked the bucket with a camera looking at it. I mean, there was, there's something about just the immediacy, and it really kind of begin, it has that life to things. And I think that sometimes overproduction just is very counterproductive. Um, just different frames of that one. Unfortunately, this, the tape I wanted to bring to you is not here about that. Signage, we etched all the signage in glass, so that's a beautiful thing about design, then merging into material. What materials are appropriate for this icy bar, for example, is like they have the wet bar or they have the, the sushi bar. This is the way that Tom Main, because this was a project that I was hired through Tom Main for ARC restaurants, and they fed me this information. It's like basically these are the folds, whatever is in there matters. Tom Main basically said, all I can imagine is a, a muse, a kind of a sense of a body. And uh, so basically these are the folds, and then this is what I had to create with them, is basically you're looking at from about maybe here to here, you're looking about 60 feet. So what was fantastic, the, the main thing is like, sure, you can do murals, sure, 20,000 square foot, I cannot even imagine what that is, so sure. <laughs> and then all my computers like bombed. I mean, there was no way any of my studio computer could sustain this thing. So I'm having to rent computers. And part of the thing that is fascinating about existing in a boundaryless situation is that you throw yourself at situations that, yes, okay, great, I didn't make any money. But the reality is that in this, what mattered was that I entered an area of, of, uh, of uh, uh, expression that was, it just expanded my studio, expand, expanded where I had been. Here you see combinations of images of some of them I shot underwater, some of them a friend of mine shot in Tijuana, the lights, and other, all of the other ones I found, uh, a couple of other people that have gone to Beijing, and another one had been in, in Japan. This is another one, and again, this is something little, few things that storytelling again, that of course is by the stairs. You're going down as this is by your side. This is right where you're going to the bathroom, so these kids are looking at you, you know, as you're going to the bathroom. So is the, the, the idea of the intimacy and the objectivity of that, the objectivity of that, there's that piece. And all of it is composed in Photoshop and with the uh, Illustrator files that they would give me. Each file ended up being about two gigs in Photoshop. So to be able to even open it up, I needed powers that I had never had to deal with. This was done how long ago? Maybe like um, three years ago, something like that, four years ago. So that is how the, you know, the architects, you know, uh, uh, brought the images into the space to begin to get a sense of things. But what was nice is like they gave me a model that was about this size and I would just honestly go in there and get in there with a little light and just try to identify where the heart of these things wants to be. 
Is it at the entrance? Is it in the back? Where is the cold spaces? Where are the places you don't visit? So it really was a, a beautiful thing to kind of like begin to inscribe space with a kind of branding according to um, its function. That's beautiful. I just love that image. It, what's beautiful about this is that when you combine your knowledge with other fields, things that you would have never imagined emerge. The first thing, for example, that I would say to anybody is that don't bother looking at design annuals. Don't even, you know, just don't, don't even enter the competitions. It's just a matter of go to, into philosophy, go to science, I mean, go to Caltech. And, and that's, I mean, working with architects, it just gives you forms that you would have never imagined existed. So that's how it looks like in reality. These are very low res images. I think some other ones will come soon in the next piece. But it ends up being a very interesting experience. It's definitely like very strange Baroque experience. I'll show you, this is on site. I was with uh, both Saha Hadid and, um, and Greg Lynn. I went to Yale and I was in their committee to discuss some works about um, branding architecture. I mean, and it's very interesting how brand is so defined as a visual language already has its own, you know, kind of uh, processes and everything. So what does it mean to them begin to brand architecture? And I think that, you know, Christian, your work so much in many ways, the way that you change a space through light and through sound, that's the branding. What Jennifer Steinkamp does, the breathing of a building, I mean, that's a beautiful usage of branding versus plastering some dumb building with a logo. I mean, that's just... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you've seen that that's sometimes what ends up happening in terms of branding. Okay, what's happening here? Yeah, so that's kind of the light and some spaces are really calid. Is that a word? Like warm? Está calido es muy... has to be a word, it comes from Latin. <laughs> And of course, typography goes there. It's just the songs to Fisherman. There is a haiku about uh, 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 food, and it's just, it's, it's a really, um, there's one that it says, Ichigo Ichie, which is the spirit of um, the tea ceremony. And it's basically one lifetime, one meeting. It basically is about the fact that at one point you meet, you let, you leave behind all of your preconceptions and strata social strata, and then you just convene and you enjoy that moment. Rebecca, where, where is this restaurant? Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that. It's in Las Vegas. It's within the Venetian Casino. And what's interesting about this is that immediately during that time, of course other restaurants began to open, but the idea of branding through murals, it began to be, a, 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 you know, it took off. It's taking off of there. So it's um, more and more influencing the way environmental env environments are experienced. Okay, let's see. Um, another thing, I think I'm gonna go to a completely different thing. I think I'm gonna go to, well, it's, this is a bridge, it's an interesting bridge, Microsoft. When I was at Wyden and Kennedy, um, there was a possibility, I was working for Microsoft, Microsoft was the account I was given, and I was working with primarily the back office, which is very, very much the back end, NT, IT, so it's very much about system. But this was an opportunity, this was another project in which we, Microsoft was starting um, their uh, venture into going into, um, no, I don't want to start there, going into retail. So we had to conceive and design a retail store. Um, we hired Neil Denari, this is a team by Whitney Lowe, myself, and about other uh, four people. And we hired Neil Denari to, to help with the architecture to design the space. In the end, really, I mean, Microsoft and Sony were the ones doing this, and they 
chickened out in terms of the architecture. It was too contemporary, and it's sad because it really was something that if anybody could do it, it would be them. They have the money, they have the, the market share, the mind share. So anyway, it was from naming the company, from creating a system that it would be Microsoft Berlin, Microsoft LA, Microsoft anything, creating screens. It was the first time that I did signage in which every screen was individual plasma screens. There would be images projected behind according to the area that I was talking about. So living, their software about living is what, how does it benefit the, the, the people, people in the working space. And so this, in a way, I'm just giving you very quickly, just this was the visual language that was developed for the whole store. Everything was modular, their furniture was modular, and the, the color palettes, everything was working around this. This is the space. The space was very, just fascinating. Everything just flowed. Of course, you know Neil Denari's work. So it was very appropriate. And um, it ended up in concept for us. They ended up taking parts and, you know, just implementing them at will. Um, and now the store is closed. It was at Yerba Buena in San Francisco, in the Metreon building. Was this a physical model or a rendering? A rendering. Yeah. yeah, the physical model just never, yeah, we didn't get that far. It ended up looking like a potted barn. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing is pottery barn is going to look like a technology place. Maybe that's the only way to get there. <laughs> Um, another thing, I think that one of the things that it's been, I'm going to go to Trend Micro. Trend Micro is an interesting thing because it's another advertising piece in which one of the things about how one blends from one space to another, how much of your thinking, how much of your interest in, you know, your own individual questions, your philosophical questions can apply in this world. In many ways for me is that if I am able to communicate above, beyond, about, around, all of whatever the preposition is appropriate there, the message. If I'm selling you software, can I communicate something that actually makes you think differently about something? And um, this was my, our, our task here. And um, with, with Trend Micro, which what they do is security, um, information security for networks. They are, um, they have antiviruses. They're known primarily for antivirus. Their competitors are Semantic, which does Norton Utilities. So basically something that obviously in our time and age, it has kind of moved from being whatever, the IT, I don't care, it's a software. No, now it's a very important thing to have for your business. It's a business asset to have a good security. So, so far, nobody in the market has owned that. They don't have, in mind share, Semantic has the most. So what we thought is like, we met the, the owners. The owners are two people from, they're from China? Taiwan. Taiwan. Uh, Jenny and Steve Chang, they are brilliant. They're incredibly intuitive people. We asked them, it's like, how is it that you arrive at these innovative projects? And they said, you know, it's like, it's something we just know. We just know through observing the market and through trusting where we're going. So it was interesting, it's like intuition. Can that be something that this culture can swallow, can trust? Is there a way that we can speak about intuition that it really brings and merges a mind because most of their market is in Japan? Is it able to bring and merge? Is it able to communicate about the way that how technology no longer can function if it only is reactive? The only way that technology can evolve and the way that it's been proving that it's evolving in uh, um, I, Intelligence, oh, artificial intelligence. In artificial intelligence and all of that, it's like how that is, if you are able to anticipate as a human is able to anticipate, if you're able to mold your, your technology to be able to be active versus passive versus reactive, is the way that they think about their business, the way they think about their technology, and they have been able to come up with great things. So we came with the, with the idea of, yeah, let's put forward, let's put forward intuition as, intelligence combined with experience. It's like you need to have experience. The way intuition ha works is that it is knowledge based on experience and it's based on an overall sense of experience and having a sense of the moment at, at, you know, at once. So felt sure, let's put it forward. So we created intuitive security, no, what is it? Intuitive information security. Then we said, okay, so we have that. Now what about, how, what functions in a similar manner 
in the field that could give us another metaphor that would be very powerful because again in branding we're myth makers what is our myth so it was interesting we were sitting on a weekend until about two three four in the morning Adam was in my team and then Whitney Lowe was on my team and basically you know Adam came up with the idea of how about the go the game of go the game of go is something that you it's very simple it's two moves it's two stones zeros ones maybe two stones but it takes a lifetime to learn it, and it is how you train samurais, samurais in the past. It's a how many thousand years old game? 5,000 year old game in which everybody that was, you know, it's like, no, right now, for example, uh, the, the program that IBM came up with, which is Deep Blue, or What Blue, something blue, and um, they are, of course, they want to Casper off. It would take, a move that would take Deep Blue one and a half minutes, it would take to, to make the same, the similar move, 1.5 years. Oh, yeah. yeah, they cannot compute it. Nobody has been able to create a computer game of Go that actually can beat the mind. So we thought, what if we then, as part of advertising, as part of, in a way, creating something that changes the mind of people in that area, we gave them a game. So we branded a game, and we started working with the game of Go. We had experts coming from everywhere. Adam interviewed with, there's a wonderful uh, Go master, a woman, Janice. I don't know if I'm missing something important there. But then again, it's like, then how do we like, you know, code all of these? Go red, go red, red is their color. So you'll see that everything else follows that. Within every part pattern, there is a trend. Oh, and the way to is that we had to read The Art of War by Lao Tzu. Very important because, in a way, it's like this is all about territory and about um, how is it that we protect information. So these are wild postings were plastered all over the city. Maybe you guys saw them. If not, they should give us our money back because hey, it was going to be all over the city. <laughs> I don't know. And these are more beginning to establish photography. Photography was very important for this to remain very much, very close to the moment of a decision in which your body and your whole self is very present. It is objective, in a sense, black and white is very, the, 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 the photography and the design are very severe in line, they're severe in, their, in the way that they are um, uh, in composition. They, in a way, if you could say, they have a sense of maybe a, a bit of a restrained uh, um, design system. And it is part, obviously, because we're talking about computer systems. It was appropriate. We're speaking to business people. So it's just been an interesting challenge of how, again, you move the mind of a corporation. It's very different than really navigating in your museum world, which I have been for many years. So I'm, my challenge is to, can, do I have something to say that truly enlightens or brings something else than just selling a product? So far, what's very interesting is that some people in, um, in the offices, they're like, you know, the moment that the six o'clock or whatever comes, they close their door and put playing go. I mean, it's just so there is a culture that can definitely grow. Also, um, Sega, I think, is coming up, PlayStation is coming up with a go game for kids. I mean, it's just incredible how it is a great way of, like, um, um, getting mine. And from that, there is a website. So let's try to go to the website of that one because I think that that was a, a, an important, very important part. Oop, we bombed on that one an important part of their communications, of course. It's like that's where, there's where things happen. There's where we could go with more depth. This is a mini site that we would convey the brand, the new mind of where they were going. They're going. And this obviously connects to Trend Micro through there. Okay, I'll let you read that. So we go, if we want to go, there's strategies, there's intuition, all these buckets that contain all of that information. Um, I can go to each one of them. One of the interesting things that we have to deal with is that we have to, at Ogilvy and Mather, is like we're so used to doing everything ourselves. Here what it is difficult or different is that you have to deal with third parties in things. So here we had to partner with Ogilvy One. 
So how do you, in a very short period of time, with a very, very uh, uh, clear way of your brand is, pair up with another team that you have no clue of their skills, you don't know how it's going to work. And that is something that it is where you kind of like stretch and do, just do fly to New York, be here, no, stay up all night. And that, it's really one of those interesting things about collaborations that mm, we don't experience much in school, but you will. So here you go again, you can, you're able to go, um, I don't know, I remember what's down here, but there is case studies that you go in there um, uh, about their strategies. Um, different, so you can go there. You can get a white paper about control manager, which is their, um, like the place where the intuition could happen. Although we're learning, one of the things that also we're learning is the fact that they're not ready. They're beginning to realize they're selling something they have no clue what they're talking about. <clears throat> which is a U-turn in any business. It's like, okay, we have these. We came up with this strategy and we're like, <coughs> excuse me, we don't have the product and we won't have it for another five years. I mean, it's, it really sends you like for a loop. So we're rethinking strategy because this control manager doesn't exist yet. They promise it might. So here about intuition, we have, you know, obviously the part that is very specific, how it relates to strategy and all of that. But then we also have amazing quotes. So the mind is very mathematical, very scientific, very appropriate to our market, ITs. Okay, so I, you guys can navigate in there. It's an interesting thing throughout. Oh, yeah, the game of Go. I'm kind of missing one part that is my favorite. So here, one of the key things is that we began to just give people the very basics of how to play Go. So you go to the rules, it explains the, the history, then you, they can begin to teach you, they explain what the board is, and then you go into different plays. This is what is called an Atari, da da da. So you can really learn how to play through these very basic rules. And also, um, again, we are, um, I think there's a challenge. You can even go and begin to play against the computer a little bit. So you take like, you know, the difficult one, and then you take your stone and you place it, and they go, ooh, burro, wrong. So it's, um, That's that. Um, another project that's very interesting to me is that with Greg Lynn, we worked on a project of being with the um, IBM Atelier, which is the Museum of Art and Technology in Chelsea. There were 13 architects in the final um, uh, list to be able to create a museum in Chelsea for art and technology. What would that be? So um, I was in the team with Greg Lynn. And let's hope this works. But basically, our concept, his concept in terms of architecture, was to be able to have, let me just kind of hold that, just to be able to have a beacon of a broadcast in the middle of Chelsea, to be able to have a museum that broadcasts not only curated work, um, messages, possibly sponsored work, uh, you obviously would have the sponsor and all of that. So it was a way of being able to take the museum to the skin and be able to make it be a communications um, uh, beacon. Oh my God, let's see, no, there's no sound, so good. I don't worry. That's Bill Viola's work. Sorry about the bumpy thing. I didn't catch this one before. Which year was this? This was last year. Yeah, just last year. And they were exhibited at the museum, and um, Dillard and Escofidio won the, the, the competition. But we had, who were the Dutch guys, R M V V V V M E M M, lots of letters. Um, what was there? <coughs> Asimpot, I think, was in there, in the team. So for us, what, what I had to do is basically then is create a, um, 
communication strategy for them. So it's like, how is it that then we move from this, uh, what, how we, what are we going to communicate? What are truly the, op the, the possibilities that we have? And also the technology available. It's like, do we do it only with monochrome LED? Do we advertise at what times do we do art? At what times do we do commercial work? At what times do we do actually a sponsored work and social work? So that was an interesting thing of part of, the, of, of my um, uh, contribution was, is it how is it that we go content versus technology? What else? I think I'm going to go to posters. That's four. How are we doing with time? Yeah? Okay. The series of posters you'll see here, it's something that um, uh, they are for very different clients. This one, for example, is for Hanover, the World Expo. Um, they called 12 designers from around the world. On this one, I went representing Mexico. And we were to put together a collection with which they would uh, promote the um, uh, expo. <clears throat> they basically, um, a, uh, what was it, Lori Haight, no, McCoy, Kathy McCoy was representing the United States. I love these. And uh, a Peruvian um, Maljuf, Veronica Maljuf represented South America. Three women represented the American continent. Yay! <laughs> that was good. So um, what was great about this is that so it was, they flew us all there, put us in a hotel. They said, you have a date to conceive, a date to design, a date to do production. And I think, I don't even put my students through this. <laughs> so needless to say, we arrive, they give you a little camera. And the funny thing is that everybody is like to search, research the city. So you're going and you're going with your crew. They assign you a couple of students or something. And you're going and you would get to a museum. It's like, oh no, the Japanese person is there. No. <laughs> so it was really an interesting, almost spy thing that you would want to be in a place on your own. So anyway, after about a day, I mean, I have nothing. I can't think of anything. It's like, how do I promote this that is meaningful? So meanwhile, we had to put some fires. Adam was there. We put some fires of UCLA, a newsletter that we had to do. So needless to say, night didn't exist. And uh, four o'clock in the morning, I said, I'm fed up, I'm going for a walk. So we started walking, and it was maybe more like five. And suddenly, we walked into this beautiful forest, a very nice forest. It's just it's a forest in the middle of the city. It's gorgeous, and it's dark, and it's beautiful. And then suddenly, I just look at Adam, and I go, Adam, take your shirt off. <laughs> so, <laughs> OK. <laughs> and it was gold. The idea of controlling the year 2000, what's going to happen? We can predict, we can know. It's like, no way. It's like, stop controlling. Breathe. Be in, surrender to the involuntary aspects of humanity or of humankind, of actually even existence, that just continue. It's not up to you. So for me, it's about breathe. Allow the ellipsis of continuity. Allow the 2000 to continue. It's very, it's very simple in that. And of course, the Hanover symbol is these two things I hear. So I put the body in that way. So there is also interaction. Maybe for everybody who does not know, uh, Hanover is probably the most boring city in the uh, northern part of Europe. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You sure don't want to be. Exactly. <laughs> so you need to really promote it. <laughs> so anyway, it was a great experience in the end. And it was beautiful to see different methods. Kenkato from Japan sits down quietly, silently perfectly sharpened pencils on the side, colored pencils, the most beautiful colors. And he just begins. Meanwhile, I'm like a chicken without a head, just like running everywhere, reading everything, interviewing everybody. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating, the methodology. It's great. <laughs> um, this one was a piece that uh, was done for a book that uh, David Carson did called Intu uh, The Second Sight. We connected because we both were in Amsterdam giving a lecture, and it happened that his lecture and my lecture both touched, in different, completely different points of view, but touched the issue of intuition. So this one, in a way, for me, there was something I think, um, I don't think I can read my writing, but it encompassed work that has been done. The piece on the hands was done. It's a love letter to Adam, which I will speak of later. This one is an, experimenting, an experimentation on dissolution. So it's all about dissolving the self, because that is in a way, or dissolving your, 
part of yourself that it is the one that anticipates and this, it's stuck in the past. And water, of course. But anyway, there's something in there in my text that I wrote that it said that the intuition for me is a moment that as your mind oscillates between past and present and future, and especially you never find yourself in the present primarily because you, you know, we're, we're, we're very, you're not used to live in the moment, that, like be perception, be a raider of perception, which is interesting because that's the only weapons we really have, as, uh, not the only, but one of the most important weapons we have as, as, as visual communicators or communicators in general. So it is the moment that you are completely present in yourself and able to, in a way, perceive a totality of both with mind and for all your full self that you can get a sense of a knowledge, a knowing in totality. I might prove that one day. This was from Mexico um, uh, uh, in response to a, a call for, and, uh, not a call for, but, it, but another competition of post, no competition, a, a collection of posters for us to um, uh, make our commentary on America after 500 years of the conquest. Basically what I looked into, it was very hard to know how to speak. Is, 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 do I speak from a political point of view? Do I speak from myself? Do I speak from what? So I chose to speak from more my experience as I came to this country. One of the things that I noticed is that as soon as I came to this country, everybody wanted to categorize me, to put me in some kind of place. You're Chicana, Latina, Hispana, Mexicana. It's like, wait a minute, like where, where all those codifications come from? So it was a way to, in a way, know, own, discard no own discard. And so that happens very much like, for example, I put the poodle there. It's, uh, you know that it is a great hunter. No, maybe you don't know. Great hunter. You only know that it's a ridiculous dog that Beverly Hills people have. That's an identity that we all have some kind of, like, you know, like, oh, you're stuck there. So it's about identity, excess of identity. You perceive it. You, you evolve it. You suffer it in your body. But at the same time, it is through that change and evolution, understanding that you're not as a, 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 like here, this is more of a prosthesis in a way. It's like I was thinking, it's like something appended into your body. And then the idea of the Columbus boats as wallpaper, something meant to cover something undesirable with something nice. So it's um, identity, I see it very much like that. And then some of these posters maybe you have seen, these are for UCLA, basically just announcing the speakers, very simple. The idea of architecture being represented more that, that for, by that which stands in a space and you love, you know, maybe, and that cast light or use, utilizes space. And then this is another poster for them too. Which again, I resurrected that image of the, of the body. And this one was important because it was two fashion designers originally that they were coming and now one, and you can hardly read that, but it was Cheyenne, Shalayan, Shalayan. What else? Maybe the tenere. Let's just change a little bit. Um, one thing, some, and maybe these will take us to the films. I think that might be good. Am I missing something that I should show you? Huh? La cow. Okay, la cow. Um, Adam and I, for our honeymoon, went to to um, Africa, to the tenere, to the most remote area of the Sahara in Niger and is the land of the nomads. And I'm fascinated with the idea of boundaries and how boundaries affect, again, uh, I think it has a lot to do with how one behaves when one is within a boundary. What has happened with the, with the Tuaregs is that basically, as they have been, boundaries of state have been established, they can no longer migrate for the health of their cattle, their health of their people. So they've been located. So they're pretty much becoming extinct because they, for them to become sedentary and farm is so against their culture and against their, if they see it as a class difference to have to be sedentary, it's lower. So this is a documentary that I'm working on. I just brought very few stills, but it's just fascinating. The, the beautiful women and men, I mean, it's just incredible. And how um, they, they're, they're all the rituals, the dances, the, the, the way that they just have a life. So I don't know what I'm going to do exactly about that. We're, we're working on it. But it's just I wanted to bring these beautiful images because it's uh, very powerful.
these little things they're wearing used to be, you know, they would make their own pigments. Now they use the cigarette metal that people leave behind. So it's the, the metal that you have in cigarette packages, that kind of foil, they use that. It's, it's interesting what they begin to use and their dresses contain a lot of broken bottles and glasses and, 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 and glass. So it's, I'm interested also in that, in that cross um, pollination of those. What's the, name, what's the kind of nature of this film? So how, how do you see it? Is it, is it, is it about the social life? Is it about the surface? Kind of aesthetics of the, of the, how do you how do you see the, the way of characterizing? No, those, that's has been the most difficult thing because I don't want it to be a pretty thing and just have no meaning. It, it would be a waste. I would like it to to be in a way um, make people aware of the limitations of boundaries and how that can stifle people and therefore. How is it that the world, can the world do anything? Can the countries next to them do anything? I mean, I don't know. I also don't want to be an idealist social thing that it just kind of uh, romanticizes the culture. So that has been a very difficult, uh, you know, one of the things in communication, I always know that once you identify your point of enunciation and the message you're going to say, phew, just shoot it like an arrow and just don't deviate. I don't have yet that. And I feel that that's one of the things that it has been in the works for a while because it needs to make, to have meaning besides. You know the whole, you know the debate around uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's work in yes. Africa, so that's a good source, like too big to mm -hmm. good think about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I'm sorry. The Bauer Museum has a huge exhibit on Niger. Right? Yes, I read about that. I think that we would definitely want to go see. Because it's very rare that people talk about Niger. I mean, it is now the poorest country in the world. It was, yeah, the poorest country in the world. Where was the thing in Lichtenstein? Was that in Lima? No, I don't remember exactly Yeah. Okay, one of the things that also, uh, doing work for advertising agencies, if anything, if it can open a door to me to be able to then support and know how to communicate for causes I believe in. And I think that that's something that I want to at all times do. And this is for LACAO, is Los Angeles Commission on Assault Against Women. And uh, it's an anti-rape campaign that so far it has print. It has been out in the, in the world for about, I mean, in Los Angeles, for about um, maybe five years or so. And I'm working with a writer, Charles Hall, who has been, he's an amazing writer, you'll see. But so right now what we're doing is that giving the new campaign and we're gonna also do the television spots for them. This is a combination of both billboards, postcards, and um, uh, all kinds of communications that appear. I'm working with a designer from Argentina and with a photographer from Venezuela. Who both the photographer is a fine art photographer and, and deals with a lot of issues of assault. Mm -hmm. And I think I might just do um, the Bill Viola, maybe. I have a Bill Viola that I did for the Whitney Bill Viola I book. Have a question, sure. Do you, do you think that these sort of com campaigns have impact? Because they are really, I, I don't know them so much from where I'm 
from. And here I see them very often. Uh, huge billboards. And, and I have to think, what, what is this about? You know, uh, uh, anti smoke campaign and a lot of these things. The, the AIDS. Anti drugs and all yeah. that stuff, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, the presenting these sort of issues on these large billboards mixed with all this advertising. Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a nice thing that it happens, but uh, do you think it's effective? You know what, or is I it just uh, some sort of general excuse of being helpless anyway? No, the thing about it, I, I don't think that that's that, because I think that billboards in general, it applies to all things. You basically, with a billboard, you just hope to get awareness, to gain awareness. That's really as much as you can hope, as even if you're selling a computer or you're selling um, or you're uh, you know, communicating an issue. I believe that through putting it out, what, talking to the people at Lacau, what has happened is that people that maybe would not dare to speak about it, would not dare to contact anybody, they do. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because the effective aspect of it is, is also you can monitor some, but this is not something you can test because it is very delicate matter. From that huge place, it needs to go to a complete intimate space. So that's the difference between, you know, maybe a product and this campaign. You hope to gain the awareness so people know that there's an organization that they can help them. And it has been effective for Lacau. They do, people do call because they see them and they know that there's an organization they could search. Sometimes years go by from one moment that they see something to the moment they call. But I think that it is, uh, uh, there is the awareness. I think that that's, realistically, that's as much hope that we can have or like how much reach that we can have. So, no. <clears throat> This is a book for the Whitney Museum. Some of you might have seen it. It basically, when the Whitney Museum did the uh, show on Bill Viola, it came here to Los Angeles, and then here I did all their billboards, and uh, pretty much the overall look and feel that was developed for the book <clears throat> became the, <coughs> the one for throughout the, throughout the world. It went to Amsterdam. I think it was also in Berlin or Frankfurt, I don't know. Frankfurt. So it was interesting that, that by, through a book, the, a, lo, a whole language was developed. Interesting working with, with Bill. Fascinating. Sometimes you don't know how it's going to be the experience. Sometimes the artist is very like, you know, you just meet the artist and it's like you can't even speak two words and very, uh, uh, there's no connection. With Bill, there was an amazing connection. He definitely is somebody that just gives you the, the uh, ammunition to be able to get very close to his, um, his art. This one primarily for me was a, a very important to be able to give, have, after piece, his pieces are time-based, it was important for me to give the space for time-based. So there was something that there was a sense of, of movement, the lateral movement, and then also there was a sequence. I remember at the beginning they gave me one or two images and I said, that doesn't help me. It's like yours is not a painting. It has to be treated differently. In the end, you know, Bill, um, uh, Viola said that basically that I was able to bring the, the time aspect of his work into a book for the first time. <clears throat> These, for example, in a gallery or in a museum, they stand side by side and they create, one is projected on one side of the room, the other one in the other. So even through the design of the book, you're able to begin to give people the signs of how this is um, uh, uh, presented. And this was also all the pages, one after another, of how this man emerges from underneath the water and comes all the way forward. So that took about maybe 16 pages. So it was a way of being able to do sequential design through print. And then right now, I just finished the one for the Guggenheim for um, his exhibition that is about to finish also in... Berlin and is coming to New York. Is that where it's going next? Forgotten, but I think it's going to New York. And this one, what's interesting about this one is that it's basically two books. One of the first book had to be done very fast because the um, lender, who's, who's the sponsor? What, I forgot the bank, Deutsche Bank. 
Deutsche Bank had to have something in the opening and the work was not ready until the very last day of the opening. So by the time you photograph, print, and da da da, it would take about three weeks or four weeks. So we did a book first that it was, we call it the process book. And you'll see the next cover. So this is the main book. It's all, um, I have them here so you guys can look at them. And this is the book of the process. So there was something very much a feeling of undone, almost a paper that is just uh, um, still white or, or a canvas that's still white or a screen. A lot of translucency in the, we used the vellums um, throughout, primarily for the type. We used a lot of the sketches. A lot of his sketches became very important to place there. We have usually, I've been wanting to do that with Bill. Originally with the Whitney, that was the, the most important part was going to be at least about 50 pages of just his thinking and his mind and his sketches. For these books, I was able to put what maybe like um, 40 pages, which was very nice. And um, just. A book? Yeah. It's basically myself and one other that works as a system designer in production. Of course, for example, in this case with the Guggenheim, I had to work with their editors. So if I would have to create my own team, then that would add. But, uh, hey, Milka! <laughs> See, you're good. Yeah. And the poster, like the rape, series of rape posters? It's uh, myself. Uh, the writer sends me the copy, and I have one assistant. Yeah. So, so in that case, the writer would give you the copy, and then you would make the image. In this case, it happened like that because he had already written that copy. What happens now if it's a new project? We pair ourselves with a writer, which is crucial. And then we both conceive of the idea. And then sometimes he comes with the idea or she comes with the idea of the writer. Sometimes I come up with some of the text. So it really is interesting how when you put those two minds together and you really cross a little bit, it's pretty healthy. So yeah, but it's, uh, I, I won't pretend that I'm a great writer of that kind. I mean, it's just like that meaningful. I'm, I have ambitions and I might want to become one. This one also was bilingual, the process book. And this one is a lot of large images, spreads. Sometimes they open in double fold. Again, the book is for round for you guys to browse through it. Production on this one was amazing. It's like you're having to design a book that part of it is not being done, but part of it will be done, and trying to correlate and trying to, to just match all of those schedules. And one, you know, people are in Berlin and there's in New York and it's LA. I mean, that's, I love the, the, the web because it was amazing. There was the only way in FTP sites and all of that to be able to make this happen. So that, again, talking about boundaries being blurred. How much time is involved in such a fast, super, or too fast project? I mean, you, you call it almost too fast, right? Too fast. You know what, I think what happens initially is like the project comes. Everybody, mm, whatever, yeah, let's not define anything. Let's just kind of like, oh, yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, mm, a month goes by. But everybody's like, okay, yeah, we started. And then when the moment that really begins, I mean, we had three weeks, a month to do this. Usually, I mean, with the, with the, with the Whitney, it was much more elongated. And I would say that for something like this, for us to crank design, it was very fast. It was three weeks that we had to crank design and about two weeks to crank mechanical. And with that, it's like try to coordinate with the artists, try to get the images. They're video artists. So they have to have look at their tapes, select the images, download them, give us the actual file, have that one be interpolated. It's, it's, it, was, it was very difficult. And then from that point, it went to the printer. Um, uh, even from that standpoint, I wasn't able to go to the printer and Amanda Amanda, something helped me with that one, who was wonderful. But at the same time, that then in the middle of that process that is too tight, still they ask you to do, oh, you know what? We can't, we're not gonna finish this one, so do a parallel second book at the same time. So it was very trying, but I would say that in general, what you would want to do is at least exploratory, you have a month, and then to refine design, you have another month, and then be able to put together all of the mechanical of the work at least another you know, five weeks or so. Um, what do you think? Have you you're working in books, Rebecca? No. no. <laughs> okay. Actually, that's not my best one. It is, but if you're working with a lot of the the, um, the editors and all, of this, it's like it has to do a lot with copy and changes of copy, yeah, and it's correct. yeah, that's hefty. And of course, you're dealing with like you know 300 images sometimes, and and that's the part, the production part is the hef the really big part. Did you have a 
others or what media artists before you did these this things for what we all want. So when you work with other artists, let's say working with video installation. You know what? My master's was in video art, so I know that I worked a lot in video installation with Diana Thader, with Jennifer, um, uh, no, what is this? Jessica Bronson. So during that time, of course, we collaborated in some projects. Um, so video installation, the only other experience is when we were in, um, when I was the design director at Art Center with Steve Nolan that he curated with uh, Haki Heki, Eki Ke. Yes, you, oh good, I just, sorry, it's like I didn't connect, <laughs> hacky kacky, <laughs> no, that was nice, <laughs> I, helped, I helped him with the uh, signage, <laughs> nice to meet you, because you write amazingly, <laughs> I remember your, your writings on that, so, um, <laughs> and, um, so, uh, yeah, so I designed the signage for that exhibition, remember the video installation on that a little bit, and, so sometimes when Steve would have that, I would, I would work with him. That's a moment, and it's not necessarily a Kodak moment. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I will learn your name, I promise. <laughs> I'm just so bad at, at names. So with Bill Viola, did, how did that contact happen? Um, Bob Stein, who I don't know if you guys know, but Bob Stein is the founder of Voyager. He knew me and he spoke to Bill and Bill met me and we liked each other and then we worked. The old way. <laughs> or the common way. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it was something obviously to be working, you know, coast to coast. Um, I think that maybe we move to the films. Journey, was that your name? Great. And I remember something about wearing maroon when I would go on a journey. <laughs> because believe me, I have to do my own tricks about names. It's just obviously I just completely messed one up. A very important one. Yeah, just play. What you're going to see is um, this is a love letter that was sent through the web, a, a visual artist responding to a writer. And that's long, I know. <laughs> about that piece is that it, there was a, 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 the time of when people would write letters intrigued me very much. It's like how is it that one writes a letter, imbues a paper, and it's the action of writing and expressing your love to something that you don't know if the person would even receive it or what's the reaction. So it was something about the, the relationship that you have with your machine. Basically what I'm doing there is I'm at Art Center and the scanner is there, I'm teaching, and at the same time I have to find the moment where I can throw myself and caress the scanner. Because it is the way in which I'm able to communicate most directly into this, this uh, at least at that time. So there was um, an interesting relationship I had with my computer. The <laughs> and with Adam, of course. The next thing um, you're going to see so is a short film that I did as when I was teaching a class at Art Center of digital filmmaking. We um, did a, uh, an idea with, with Rick Morris. We divided the class into three parts, and we decided to create a film that was based on the 
uh, exquisite corpse of the surrealist in which you would, everybody does one part and you don't really know what's happening except you give yourself a connection. It was based on the myth of Orpheus and my section to work with was the moment in which she descends back into the underworld and then Orpheus goes and tries to get, get her back. What's interesting here is that obviously the parts, I'm, I'm right now only showing the one part due to time and um, worked with a couple of students and um, it's just, uh, again, it was my first, my experimentation on, on filming underwater and uh, the idea of basically two things that matter that happen there is surrendering and control. That was part of that. And it was premiered in the Res Fest in Tokyo, in Chicago, New York. in a panel discussion with Mike Figgis, <coughs> the filmmaker for Living Las Vegas. Um, it was interesting because one of the things that I call this a sketch, basically it's a sketch towards something. I feel that this is moving towards an area of film that I'm very interested in, and it is the, uh, the, the in my lecture what I exposed in the panel discussion was that we need to, like the idea of moving in film from the collage, from the montage, and in moving into something that is more continuous. Is, 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 is very interesting and I think that that's, it needs to happen because very much we are fixed by a specific metric, by a specific way, a method of, of doing film that obviously is now an archaic method. And so to move into something that is much more continuous, even in the words of Jeffrey Kipnis, the voluptuous, is, is fascinating to me. And I think that that was one of the <coughs> ways in which Mike Figgis and I connected because his attempt or his, his uh, work of time code very much was based on that. And as we, we were both speaking there, I, he ended up um, taking me to his set and having me direct Mia Maestro, uh, the character of, of the young filmmaker in Timecode, 
and I ended up writing her script and, and just it was a very interesting experience to be able to then move from this conceptually to how is it that then you move to the four screens? Is it a way, is that a way to liberate some of these uh, uh, montage? And I think that in that sense, both the, the, the thinking of Greg Lynn and the thinking of Jeffrey Kipnis fascinates me because it moves to animation versus motion and that's very, very exciting. Um, I don't know, I think that's all. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions or anything. Thank you. Thank you. I brought some books if anybody wants to kind of like look. Obviously, the projects are very, very, you know, I can only show very few ones. Um, so, in your work now, it looks like your primary work has to do with print, and um, and then you've been doing work with spaces, with architectural mm -hmm. spaces, and then you, you're showing some films. How much is the moving image or animation part of your future direction, or is that something that you just see as, as part of many areas that you look at? No, definitely. I think that for me, animation and the way that that can be conveyed in alternative spaces, including, I mean, for me, the computer is, is fascinating. I think that print, in many ways, I know it, I can do it, I love it in many ways, but I think that my interest is definitely in animation and, and, uh, and how that relates to virtual spaces and real spaces. So what kind of projects would you like to do involving animation? You know what, I think that I would love to work in, um, again, it's like I don't really know what it means to move into the voluptuous. I don't know physically what it means into the voluptuous, into the continuous versus the fragmented. That would be an incredible study I would love to do. What to define, how, we know it in theory. We begin to see peaks of it. But it is constructing a new machine, in a way, a new way of looking at things. And I think that maybe we're getting close to that. Now, how does that affect living spaces? To me, that would be the most fascinating. I mean, that's why I love your work, Christian, and I love Jennifer's work very much. Because it really just be begins to um, uh, create, out of the physical spaces, some malleable membranes. And, and, and uh, so. Then to, just to add to that, in teaching designers, um, you know, it used to be in visual communication you would focus really just on print and all mm -hmm. aspects of that. Yeah. How, how do you think, you know, young designers should be looking at the field or do you think things have changed? What, what kind of things Very do you think much are changing? So, yeah. It's difficult because what's interesting about every <clears throat> medium has a technique. A technique that it is very, very important to know all its levels to be able to master it. If you, I would say that there's a way to, to deal with it as more of a, of a director. Let's say if you think of yourself as an idea director, as a, as a myth director, in which you conceive of the idea and you foster in you primarily the thinking of what you want to say, the idea of narrative, the idea of storytelling, collaborations with each one of the parts is what matters. We're moving very much into the paradigm of filmmaking. And I think that that's, if, if in our minds we, be, we continue to be technicians, it's very difficult then to move into the arena to be able to affect other areas of the, that communication. So I would say that um, study the field of film. Immerse yourself in the field of film. Um, any place where you know, even for example advertising for me is important because it is a place where I am a creative director in which I work with many people, many people. My team is just the most incredible things to form a team that has the right ecology. But if I would necessarily want to master a specific technique, which in a way sometimes I miss, I know it, will move, it moves me from being able to have the mind in the large picture. Uh, so I would say that design is communication primarily. And communication begins in an idea and begins in a thought and begins in a myth and begins in, a, in an understanding of who you are, where you're speaking from, what's your audience. But I, I think that we also have some others who feel that we're actually moving from the paradigm of filmmaking mo mostly to the sort of like paradigm of multimedia or so the 
other way sure. around. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Well, multimedia. I mean, so that we have we have different ways of looking at what yeah, what's, what's different actually models. happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Multimedia, for example, definitely the same thing. It's like, to me, I see it very much as a director. You still have a lot of different parties that know their specialties and they kind of like really recombine. And they know, like an organism, it's like you know when you eat something that what the belly has to do, what the intestine has to do. So it's something that, as long as you understand all the different parts, definitely multimedia, I can see that that is a, a very good paradigm too. Is the paradigm? Is a paradigm that in many ways has evolved from cinema and moved into its own, maybe less pyramidic structure. And uh, but at the same time, I mean, even working with the Go uh, uh, Go Red website, it's like you do know that you're working still in a very, very um, uh, the structures. They they do come together more in a circle. Everybody comes to the round table. So um, I, that's how I see film. Maybe in reality, is much more. Uh, like I'm king and you're my subject, <laughs> and that's not what I mean. But it, I mean more that it is different parts with different expertise that come together into a round table to create an organism. I mean, I think to me that's the paradigm: it's an organism, it's a system. Can you talk a little bit about how you moved from video art to design to working as a designer and why you made that move? Was it must have been a conscious decision or did you fall into a situation and decided you loved it? How did that happen? I started in print, in design. So I, how did I move from design so, to okay, video? So you started in design. Why did you do graduate studies in video art? And talk about that process, basically. What, yeah, what's interesting is that, for example, what I'm doing is that I have to say that I'm filling my cart, if I use an analogy of the... <laughs> Amazon.com, whatever. But it's like I, I feel that as coming to this country, chunk, I put something in there. That really helped me understand myself as let more of a hybrid. That helped. Going through design, chunk, I have certain things that I'm acquiring that matters, that are in terms of like my way of thinking, my processes, my technique. I go into video art and in general, you know, philosophy, art, criticism, and so all that. So what attracted you to that move from design is really oh, the question. Oh, yeah, very important question. I felt that I had chosen the most empty career on earth. There was nothing in design that I could feel that was meaningful. That has everything to do with the place that I chose to start with. I started in corporate design, doing annual reports and doing um, identities for Great Western Corporation, Lockheed, Logicon, and it's like... <laughs> You know, <laughs> there was something about it. And the thing about it, too, is that I was very young. Young that I, myself, what I understand about design is that it is like a PVC pipe. If you have nothing in yourself of experience and life and something to say, it'll feel empty. And so my going into the masters was to gain experience, gain knowledge, gain thinking. Um, yeah, just to, to be able to fill this incredibly powerful tool to communicate or medium to communicate, but my going into the masters was basically to become a greater human being, a fuller human being, to have more to say, more to, to put forward. Why do I go to advertising? Same exact thing. I know I need the techniques of these powerful machines to say what I need to say. It doesn't mean I'm there. I'm in advertising, but not off advertising. So that means while you were uh, doing this experience as an astronaut? While you were making this experience uh, in the art world or in the video art world, your heart was still beating as a designer uh, in a way? Or? It never has beat as a designer. <laughs> that's the thing. It has bit. If that's a, am I saying that? It has bitten? No, that's, <laughs> that's another kind of bit. It has been bidding, beating. Be beating. Yeah, that's a beating. tough one. I went to school to learn the difference between it and eat. And <laughs> And, uh, but it is, it, it's beating more as a communicator. I can communicate through food. I can communicate through um, uh, being a politician in speeches. I can communicate through design. I can communicate through art. I can communicate through, that is not, I'm not, that, the, yeah, limited by it. I do think it's a limitation, and I do think that we all evolve from it because, and evolve it. What's interesting is that you evolve, as you evolve, you carry with you. For example, for me, what was fascinating is that when I asked for my green card, <clears throat> um, I put graphic design as a profession. 
got rejected with a note that said graphic design is not a profession, it's a, techno it's a, it's a uh, technical school. <laughs> that was, yeah, and, and it was interesting because then a couple of other friends, another Mexican friend of mine, we had to write to the AIGA letters, do, 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 and we changed policy, which was very strange. Of course, it took a few years, but <laughs> and many of us. So um, in your presentation, I think you used the word intuitiveness or in intuitive approach to um, well, what you're doing actually uh, several times. So what, what's your re relationship to theory, let's say, design and uh, mm. media theory? You know what, I think that, for example, for, for me, intuition, I became very interested in intuition through reading Bergson. I mean, it was uh, uh, Deleuze and Bergsonism, and in Bergsonism, that was very, very important for me to be able to understand intuition and those terms. Intuition as a sympathy, as a disorderly sympathy, really, I could care less about it. It is too limiting, and it is associated with, you know, weeping women, and I'm not interested in, in that. And it's something that is I'm frustrated about because it is an intelligence. And so, for me, it matters to be able to, um, if anything through articulating it through terms that the Western culture will value it. I, I, I read that. I, for me, you know, Deleuze, the way that he expresses it, even, for example, the way that Deleuze speaks about um, Francis Bacon as him being, and that I think Francis Bacon, the painter, said that he was rationally pessimist, but nervously optimist. <laughs> It's, it's fascinating to know that the nervous system has a great part in the way that you receive and you express knowledge. Now, for me, intuition falls a lot in the nervous system. Falls a lot there, but also is in reason. So it is truly, for me, it's almost if there is like a spark of something that just joins those two worlds, is that intuition. So I am, for me, it's a quest to be able to, you know, just keep on thinking about it in terms of critical theory because I, I just, uh, again, all of my masters was based on just finding and understanding how is it that the Western world then articulates something that for other cultures is like you take it as a, as a way of existing. I have a question. Yeah. And as a teacher, what, um, what is your methodology or what is your philosophy? How do you work with students and what kind of project would you like to be involved with? Mm, I, I would have to say that it depends a lot on, I have general thoughts, but I also have a specific thoughts. It depends on the, maybe the, the level I'm teaching at, it depends the, 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 the even, it has, depends very much on the cultural background, the cultural makeup of the, of the group. It depends on the uh, strengths of every class. So I, what I do first, I read where I'm standing. I do not ever try to act and impose something that it just, you know, it's just inappropriate or is, yeah, because it has to have properties of the composition I'm working with. So that would be first. Second, I would say, the first thing that I would try to say is like shake up existing paradigms that you have. Question existing paradigms that you have. Um, whether it is your culture, your language, the chair you're sitting at, the tools you use, question them a little bit. Uh, for me, very important is to have a sense of beginner's mind. Do you really know or you not know? What does it really mean to know and to not know? For me, not knowing means there's immense possibilities. Knowing the experts have nowhere to go. And it's sad. So I try to always try to see myself as not an expert of anything. And at the same time, begin every project from there, because then you begin it in a matter as if you would be a scientific experiment. It's like, OK, let me read. What are the facts? What do I have in front of me? How do I measure in terms of physical facts? And science becomes very important in the process. Scientific methods are very important. And um, the reality is that then, then you There are something in between. Can you give me one example for, let's say, reset somebody who knows into somebody who uh, <laughs> so doesn't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, I have seen Re that. Reset strategy or something like that. Yeah, what it is, for just example, is like out. even just you saying, I'm a designer, it's like you're screwed. You're limiting yourself. Yeah, but can you give me an example how to reset me? How to reset you? Yes, I think that, for example, to me, that would be, here's an example, here's a proof. <laughs> Hi, I'm one of Rebecca's students, and the answer to that question is just one word, passion. 
She has a lot of passion, and that really inspires everybody just to get up, take the ball, and run with it. I mean, it's amazing. The first I remember with, with, with so that's with, how you get reset. <laughs> exactly. With uh, with Milka, it was amazing because you know she would present her problem, and I would say, "Okay, you consider it a problem. I think it's a non-problem. So once that happens, what happens? So it's it's like you know I always believe that, re that and this is something that um, Bergson stopped, spoke about this it's like r badly stated questions is where you begin your route in the wrong place. Everything has a, like also Lewis said, that everything has a topology. Your truth, always you deserve the truths that you have according to the element, the place, and the time. And if you're on set, and the reason I kind of am thinking about this is because between an artist and a designer, I have to think of where is it that I take one path or another. And it's a very clear path. To me, it's a very clear path. It is the beginning, the origin of the question. The origin of the question for an artist is a question that they have generated themselves. In design or in commercial art, it is generated by somebody else. And you need to apply a methodology that I have to say is not different at all. They does have their specific ones when you enter media and very specific production things. What would you think, Christian, about that? <laughs> I never thought about uh, resetting somebody uh, that way. Um, no, no, I, I may pro probably would say a good approach is to be very honest with your own desires. What, do, what, what is it you really want? Uh, sorry. What is it you really want? And and uh, then somebody, some people would come up with uh, an answer like, uh, yeah. I don't know what I want, but I, I for sure I know that I don't want to suffer with what I'm doing. Yeah, so that yeah. means uh, you have to find things which you like to do, for example. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, this this reduces the options already to something, mm -hmm. and then you have to earn some money because if not, you suffer again. And the, <laughs> and so so this is let's say more the my way to describe mm -hmm. why people are doing what they are doing if they are doing it successful. It's. Uh, the knowing, the, 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 the knowledge, the experience, I don't know. I'm, 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 I don't think so much about these things, so that's probably the reason why I'm the wrong person to talk about that. But uh, um, I, I just asked the question, how do you reset somebody? Because I maybe I can make an experience. Uh, I knew, for I'm, example. Maybe I'm ready for getting even, reset it. Yeah, something. one of the ways that I was able to reset some students in, in Art Center, and, and it was amazing because I had very, there were, um, as we have many cultural backgrounds there, there was an immediate, an immediate sense of who's shy, who's not, who, who speaks, who doesn't speak. So I spent one whole class, everybody presented in their language. I could care less what the projects, if I understood, it did not matter. What mattered is that they gained strength and that that strength was portrayed to the people. And it changed the ecology of that class 100%. That is changing at the essence somebody's setting. Uh, so it's like, it's as if you move the frame of reference. And it was amazing, because people that had not laughed before, suddenly they're presenting, and of course there's two or three peers that speak the same language, so they're presenting to themselves. And that immediately just like, ah, liberated that one aspect. Other aspect is like, so you know what? You're stuck in the computer. Leave the computer aside for a while. The next two classes, nobody touches a computer. The next time is, you know what, we're meeting at the beach. Let's do the class at the beach. I mean, it's just, obviously there's things to reset. Some of them, traffic will make that impossible. Maybe we meet in the intersection of the 110 and the 405, whatever they don't mean. <laughs> but I mean, I think that there's, and I have to say it's a very simple thing. The Dead Poet Society thing of stand on your chair and look from up there makes a big difference. So I think that little things like that um, move, move. And uh, the other one is just, Foster serendipity. I mean, it's a matter of being able to create the appropriate space of contact. It's like, is it as you're conveying to me your idea, is that something that are we creating the right space? So for me, it's important to create that space with you. So if I'm creating that space, then obviously that's going to emerge. That was Louis Kahn who said, if you know the answers, when you're building a building, if you know the answers beforehand, your answers will not be true to what the problem might be. It's like you need to listen to it because the answers 
need to be appropriate, meaning they have to be, have properties of the site itself, and it tells you. So it's, you pretty much have to be a great listener. And the more thing that I do, it's almost like I just, it, it's almost like it just reorganized a little bit, just uh, realign, because everybody's a little raider. I have another question. Um, yeah. And is regarding, again, school, and is regarding the experience of being in school. And, and is regarding this research and this experiment that you talk about. And uh, as you take, for example, the scientific methodology as a paradigm to uh, try out things that you don't know, but you want yeah. to try because you don't know the answer yes, and you, you hope to learn through the process. Sometimes it implies failure in what you are doing. Yes, yes, yes. How that is? It's failure is so important. You must learn how to fail. And I, for example, when I was in school, we were the first, my, my class was, was the first generation of computers at Art Center. So we had from JPL, we had Jim Blinn, who was in charge of making all of the different, uh, 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 everything that had to do with the Voyagers and Saturn and all of these things. So he would come long hair to here and he would just say, okay, we're with Atari computers, enter coordinates on everything. And we would enter coordinates. And it was, after a whole year of a coordinates about this big, I was able to do a wheel to go <laughs> And of course, my choice of study initially was mathematics. So of course, I was like fascinated with all this coordination and stuff. So whatever, failed, all computers out the boonies. Then we came, came the S to this machine from Holland. By this time, I'm in fourth term, or no, fifth term. So what do I do? First one sign on, teach me how to use these machines. It was an incredible, it was a, a, a table that had all of the controls out, so nothing was that you had to type, but they were out. So it was a table about, you know, yay long with about, you know, maybe thousand buttons, three monitors, and you're learning. I did the most pathetic logotype I've ever done in my life. I mean, I swear, it's like I'm presenting it, and I'm looking at it, and it's my final presentation, and I'm like, I did this. And I said, I, it, it's the worst logotype. It, formally, it is stupid. But the reality is that I'm learning a new machine. I am able, it's very important for everybody to learn to be, uh, how can I say, to trip and fall and just get up. Trip and fall and just get up. Because it really is, we're going to fail, I mean, every single moment. It's a failure again, a failure again. Failure is also proportionate to the reality of your goal. Yeah, the effort, you'll fail with the same effort. <laughs> but it is, it is something that you really need to get a sense of like, okay, if my goal is like up to there, the first step is like, you know, <laughs> you're going to fall. <laughs> so I think it's very important to all of you to just set your goals in a realistic place because you need to encourage yourself to, to get a hold of them, to touch them, to touch them. It matters. That makes the difference. I never fail. Of course. <laughs> That's a question. That's why you're, aren't you Spider-Man? What's your outfit? <laughs> uh, Rebecca, you have a very distinct style of design. I was just wondering if you incorporate that into everything you do, or do you find that you have to kind of alter it for specific clients? Totally alter it. For example, if I would go with like very kind of like, m you know, mixing and doing this kind of like uh, uh, dissolution uh, based images for a brand book for IBM, <laughs> for specifically, about, it's just no. I mean, one of the things is it's appropriateness matters. I mean, I think that one of the things about a lot of my work that, um, especially in books, for example, in bookmaking, you see the difference in bookmaking that I have, especially for an artist. I am so careful and in a way particular about messing with people's arts. I mean, for example, I, I, I would hate to impose a typographic style over somebody's you know, painting. It's like, so art, your design becomes then in a way, uh, uh, you, instead of taking this position, it's only take this position. Uh, when I do the work for UCLA, what do you want to say? Prices of things and you know, a few names. So what you do is then you take more that position. If there is a position that I want to take a personality forward, then I really kind of like just uh, embrace them in, from behind. So you really need to move around your subject and find out your voice. Because if you want to impose, impose, impose your personality, then in the end you end up being a stylist. And that's really not what's interesting.
Um, and today, I think that the not only multi multimedia, but also a lot of the blending between different, say, uh, way of presentation happening, uh, still images, moving images, 2D, 3D, and also print on paper, say, digital image, also physical objects, and things like that. And generally speaking, it's interesting because we have uh, many different artists coming from different backgrounds, yeah, yeah. right? Painter, uh, so it takes kind of painting style onto the uh, sculpture, animation, things like that. And in your case, so I think you're really the strongest background is in graphic design. So uh, in this time, in this moment where this 2D and 3D, for example, in computer graphics, it's very kind of merging together yeah, yeah. and the uh, moving image possible on websites, things like that. So your approach to uh, three-dimensional uh, object or space or say uh, animation, uh, does it say, how, say, how do you uh, relate this to your say, background in graphic design, which means that the, um, uh, do you think that the, uh, to bring things from your experience in graphic design would uh, create some uh, new aesthetics in these things, or are you trying to uh, combine what uh, they do in 3D, sculpture, space design, or say, movement into graphic design? So I, I'm interested in your uh, approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I understand correctly, I think that to me, what, what's interesting about graphic design is that its outcome is very two-dimensional. Um, in terms of, let's say you're doing a poster or you're doing something. One of the things that I remember teaching very much was that for us to be able to create typography, a lot of the times we created a physical box. And you gave with acetates, with different uh, levels of, of, of uh, depth how you want your reading to, ha to happen, and truly became an atmospheric space. It just had a, a three-dimensional space. So let's say that in that instance, my thinking of design begins three-dimensional in terms of if I want to put something, attention, an object that tenses in the back, I really locate it a kilometer back. So I'm thinking spatially, even when I'm thinking that it is going to be a two-dimensional space. So in that sense, mentally, you could be able, you, you're able to do a two-dimensional space. And even, for example, if we look at Lelisinski's work and, and work that really kind of like pulls in space as a frame that you capture, as, because when, the moment that we look at something, that exists. Um, in terms of, for example, how design can also be a frame in movement that you're capturing, and that applies very much to design that wants to be activated through image and through things that kind of have a different speed. So you incorporate speed in your images, even if, again, your last image is a frame. The most interesting thing to me is happening in all the people that are doing incredible animations, you know, the, the line work and three-dimensional space. That is a language that I haven't yet collaborated much with, one, with somebody that does that, but I find it the most fascinating work. The way that a design, because what, what's interesting about space is that no matter what, you have a window, you have something that is in between. Let's say that you place a, even a ray of light, for example, that reflects on something. There are surfaces that are flat, but there are surfaces that are three-dimensional. So to think in terms of graphic design as a page only is already very limiting, and I have never thought about it in that way. Even the moment that you view it, one of the posters that I did for UCLA, which was the one in plastic, one of the reasons to be able to move it from that two-dimensional space into a three-dimensional space was to make it an object that you could that actually even just as touching it, it moves itself. So that's kind of a way in, in which dealing it in this world. What animation is doing in creating virtual spaces, in creating um, worlds that are, like, for example, Osmos. I mean, I, I just love that space. I love what that was created. What was her name, the woman? Shar hmm? Davis. Shar Davis. I, I mean, that in that, I mean, I don't know if that is specifically what you're talking about. But to me, that is an incredible space where we will exist. I can't imagine, I, it's, it's not soon enough that I have that accessible in my living room. I want to go there. I want to be able to to, to enter into these spaces. So for me, creation of those spaces is an area that if I would say there's one area that is fascinating is that virtual space. Do you, do you imagine, could you create a class 
that was a kind of design history that wove all of these ideas together? Does that interest you? You know what, I am, I have to say it interests me because I love history, but I have to say that I love doing. I mean, the body matters. And I think that um, uh, as a historian, I wouldn't say that that would be my strength because I really want to roll in the mud and just experience things. So for me, it would be really good to, of course, reference it. And it could be a parallel course, which I would love to have a history one and then a creation one. Like one, okay, let's behave like ba 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 ba. Let's do da da. Because if you don't understand things in your own body, how can you create them? How can you place them anywhere else? And, and so I think that it matters that we do perceive and, 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 uh, and receive everything and then put it out as a product with both words, language, mind, but the body. I mean, it's like, when was the last time that you rolled in the mud? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I can believe it from you. <laughs> yeah. what, 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 what about this man there sitting on, on the chair? Do you want to mention him? Yes, Adam, Adam, yes. Do you want to just tell us about Adam? Yeah, of course, of course we do, because he's so integral part of my life. He's my husband now, and uh, we've been, uh, he comes from Holland. I don't know, I mean, it's, how do we, I, what do you want to know? <laughs> he's, like such, he's a writer. We collaborate in everything. We collaborate in all the projects. Whenever, for example, we have, I have, he comes in, he's, he's to me my, the brain of a lot of things. He's the thinker. He's my think tank. So um, whenever I have any project that requires a contemplative space, the creation of space where the mind's just, in, you know, with something needs to emerge that we have no clue what it is, no clue what it will look like. Adam is the first person right next to me. His thinking is brilliant, and uh, uh, I recommend it every day. <laughs> and uh, so therefore, I mean, he's involved in advertising with me. He's involved in, for example, the two projects that I'm doing. Uh, he, he pretty much uh, put us in the path of the concept. And uh, that's something that, you know, just is, is a catalyst. I really consider him a catalyst in all aspects of, of any work. And how long have you collaborated? A long time? Six years. Five, six? Seven. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I know it's I'm not the one to remember birthdays or anniversaries or anything. So it's like it's usually the other way around. But um, yeah, I think that what that's one of the things that you guys will be so much greater next to somebody's, next to other minds. Because I really think that whether it's a writer, whether it's somebody I mean, I learned English talking to my dog. It's it's, it's I would I would Sing, you know, and I would go as if imitating the accent. And I do that with my cats in French. And I do have the accent. Now I need to learn the like, grammar. But it is something that you do expose yourself through, through that and collaboration is brilliant. Have any effect on the dogs and cats? <laughs> <laughs> what did they do? Yes, I think they started to want to, uh, to eat Big Macs or something. <laughs> and this one is asking for a lot of sauces. <laughs> Oh. It's kind of nice to end on the note of love and collaboration and meeting yeah. of minds and time flying because we're having fun. So thank you yeah. so much for sharing your... Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>